Oh, this is a nice little ditty that we call the Keithley Jig. That's no, it's actually what it's called. Written specifically for our friend Brad Keithley, who joins us this morning to talk about oil, gas, politics, and more. Apparently, I'm a Democrat. I, that's what Tom just told me. He said that he was going to connect Brad with me, and I'm apparently a Democrat this morning. Good morning, Brad. How are you? Michael, I'm doing great, and I don't I don't think I've ever thought of you as a Democrat. Well, that's good to know. Hopefully, you've never thought of me as a Republican either. I mean, hopefully, you just thought of me as a free-thinking spirit. That's what it should be out there. Uh, <laughs> We're watching. I got to be honest with you, Brad. I was really delving down into some stuff this week, and I was watching what was unfolding in Saudi Arabia, and I was pontificating on what effect that would have here on Alaska. And lo and behold, you and I are going to talk a little bit about that this morning, um, because what happens half a world away definitely does end up having an effect here uh, in in the in the great state of Alaska. So oh, almost almost immediately, uh, we're talking about oil price oil prices and oil prices have been surging of late. Uh, we have a, for a long time when we had an oversupply situation from 2014 until, um, until, uh, well, earlier this when we had an oversupply supply situation, geopolitical risk, that is the risk of things blowing up in the Middle East or blowing up in other oil regions, uh, really hadn't been a big factor. There had been geopolitical risk, but the market was so oversupplied that it didn't factor in. As markets have gotten, as, as supply and demand have gotten tighter, demand is on the increase. We've had a, a an appreciable surge in demand. Supplies have gotten tighter as a result of the OPEC cutbacks and the agreement with Russia and the Russian cutbacks, uh, and as a result of, of the underinvestment that we've had in conventional supplies starting to sort of hit home, and as a result of, of cutbacks in investment in shale oil, as supply and demand have gotten closer, geopolitical risk is starting to come back into the market. And when you have uh, uh, events like have been going on in Saudi, uh, the last several days, a, a, a missile fired from Yemen toward Riyadh, toward the capital of Saudi, uh, upheaval in the in the royal family, uh, arrests in the royal family, a statement yesterday by Saudi that they consider uh, Iran supplying weapons to uh, Yemen, Yemen as being an act of war. Uh, that was in the wake of the of the missile firing at Saudi at, at Riyadh. Uh, when you have geopolitical risk like that coming, showing back up, it, it's starting to move the market. Uh, and the price surge that we've seen in the last several days is is a reflection of two things. One, that supply and demand is more back in balance. Two, demand's on the upswing, so the, 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 the potential for a tightening of supplies is there. And then geopolitical risk adding in on top of that. And you're right, that immediately translates – uh, when that translates into into effects in the oil price market, that immediately translates into effects in Alaska. Yeah, and, and we're seeing that. And of course, what's interesting is that uh, Harold, uh, one of our listeners, sent me a, a, a grid this morning, a a, a a graphic that showed a little bit about how the effect, you know, how that affects production in the state of Alaska, which I found interesting, showing that in the last thirty days, with an eight dollar rise in in prices in Brent prices. We saw almost a forty thousand barrel increase in production uh, as the mm. price increases. Production goes up. Mm, yeah, that's that's more. I, I wouldn't attribute that. It, I would attribute very little of that increase in production to price. What we're seeing, frankly, is we're moving into the winter season, and the the dynamics, the engineering dynamics of the winter season in on the North Slope. Uh, 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 help increase production. If you look at if you look at production over time, uh, you always see an upswing about this time, and then you see a downswing when once we get into spring, things start getting warmer on the slope. It's just it's just more efficient to run run the machinery up there. Uh, production uh, uh, is more efficient um, uh, in cooler temperatures, <laughs> cold temperatures, and, right. and you just see a, a, a higher production rate in the winter than you do in the summer. So, so we're just we're you, we're just following our normal cycle then. Yeah, it, the forty thousand is 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 a bump, but I I. I I very rarely have seen price correlations. Um, I've seen correlations between price and investment levels on the slope, uh, but I've rarely seen correlations between uh, prices and actual production and actual production levels on the slope. 
Well, that leads us to talk a little bit about uh, what's going on on their slope, uh, because, as you said, investment levels seem to be increasing. We've got uh, some high expectations now, and uh, even the uh, even the uh, uh, administration has gotten in the mix there. Uh, the ADN reporting that uh, Trump ordered the Interior Department to update uh, millions of acres of petroleum reserve potential, and that spells some good news for Alaskans in the future, you think? Yeah, we're seeing we're seeing some really good news on the slope. I right, let, let's let's sort of run through it quickly. The the announcement last week of the acquisition of Armstrong's interests, uh, a, a, a big piece of Armstrong's interests on the slope, Armstrong Oil's interests on the slope, by uh, Oil Search, a company called Oil Search, uh, I think is extremely positive news. Uh, Armstrong is. The operator uh, and is the owner with Repsol of the of one of the new units uh, on the slope, the Pika unit that has been the Pika prospect that has been uh, uh, been in the news a lot. The potential of having 125,000 barrels a day or so of production uh, once it ramps up and gets to once it's developed and ramps up to the production stage. A lot of good geology in that area, uh, Conoco's. Uh, exploration and Will Willow Conoco's uh, 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 activities uh, in that same sort of area in that same in that same uh, producing horizon uh, have have really been uh, been strong in the news and now oil search coming in and buying uh, a, a significant piece and with an option of taking an even greater piece of Armstrong's uh, uh, position on the slope, I think is very good news. It's a sign of a lot of things. It's a sign that uh, outside investors think that Alaska has a lot of potential, has a future. It's a sign that outside investors have some confidence uh, in the Alaska fiscal regime. I know those of us who de deal with it daily sort of chuckle at that, but you know, an outside observer who's bringing a lot of money to play uh, into Alaska, their perspective that Alaska is a good place to invest, uh, I think is a I think is an excellent an excellent sign. Uh, I mean, small things. The fact that um, uh, oil search is coming in here, an, an outside player, an independent coming in here, making an investment at a time when it's very obvious that that we're not going to be continuing the the oil exploration credit program. Uh, that you and I have talked a lot, a lot about tax credit program that you and I have talked a lot about on the show. I think it's a sign that 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 tax credit program isn't needed. That we can attract additional investment into the state uh, without that program. So I, that, that's a that's an extremely I think the oil search acquisition is an extremely positive sign uh, for the slope. Now it also has one one interesting um, additional facet to it. Uh, the price. That oil search is reporting they paid uh, for the for the Armstrong interest is the equivalent of three dollars a barrel, uh, taking what Armstrong and, and Repsol have both said are the reserves uh, available, uh, p potential reserves available uh, and producible out of the out of the Armstrong interest, and dividing that into the purchase price. Analysts and oil search uh, uh, said that they're paying roughly $3 a barrel. That's for oil in the ground. It's not, you have to invest in it to, to right. confirm it, to develop it, to produce it, to, 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 you know, develop the infrastructure. So that's not like, you know, oil's worth $3 now. It's, it's, it's sort of, they're investing in it at a $3 level, but even, even in the current price environment, and even given the fact that it's still in the ground, that's a fairly low price. So what that tells you also is yes, there is strong interest in Alaska, uh, and yes, there is strong interest by outside investors uh, in Alaska, but they're still discounting the, pr the purchase price, uh, frankly, based upon the risk of actually getting that oil out, the risk of developing the risk that Alaska has in developing reserves. That's not that's 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 really not the fiscal issue that you see showing up there. That's the regulatory issue. Can you get the necessary permits uh, that it's going to take to be able to develop that oil? So. The acquisition is also telling us that outside investors think there's think there's risk in Alaska, but the fact they're making the acquisition, the fact they're making the the, the investment in Alaska tells you that they think they can overcome that risk. Well, and do you think that the that the state in the in the situation that it's in fiscally and everything else is going to be amenable to smoothing the way for some of these the permitting process and making that process as streamlined as possible for the new for the new uh, players in this game? 
Boy, you'd hope so. Um, uh, the state, um, the, the state tries to facilitate producer development. Sometimes they sort of get in their own way. The trouble, the more, the, the 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 bigger problem that Alaska producers have faced over the last several years has been federal federal permits that you need, not only development on federal lands and the restrictions they can put on that, but also uh, the, the necessary water permits, clean water permits you have to get out of the Corps of Engineers uh, right. and the role that the EPA plays in various things. So the, the concern, the bigger concern has been, has been at the federal level. Uh, I think that $3 purchase price is telling us that there's still concern about being able to overcome that. But I think the fact they make the acquisition is telling us that there's some faith that the Trump administration uh, uh, is going to is is going to be much more helpful in uh, in working through the permit process than perhaps uh, prior administrations were. Well, and the and the administration's move to recategorize and re-estimate all that all that 23 million acres probably is a good sign in that regard. Yeah, in the NPRA, the 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 administration has. Uh, uh, opened up uh, significant amounts of the MPRA for leasing. They are making the exploration program. Conoco's got five wells on the western uh, north slope, uh, five exploration wells coming up this season. Armstrong has two development wells. Not all of those are in the MPRA, but 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 some of those are. And, and opening up the leasing in the MPRA is also a sign that this administration is trying to make – uh, oil development on the North Slope easier. Uh, leasing leasing uh, is is an indicator of a lot of things. Uh, if you find if, if a producer finds a big field, oftentimes it's not got all of its un, all of it under lease. And in order to make uh, make a even a big field economically possible. Uh, on the North Slope, someplace remote like the North Slope, high cost like the North Slope, you need to have big quantities. You need to find, you know, significant quantities that you can spread your costs over. So when you when you make a find on a on a on a given set of leases, you you fairly rapidly want to be able to expand your holding to include the entire acreage that you think you may where, where you think you may have have productivity and you may have oil. If you've got a tight leasing regime. Uh, then you're 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 skeptical you're going to be able to do that, and so you don't go in. Frankly, you're sort of impaired from going in that in to make that initial investment because you don't know if you're going to be able to expand your position uh, if you find something. But when you have a a a, a broader leasing regime, then you're more comfortable if you go in and make that find. You're going to be able to broaden out your lease position to 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 make your uh, uh, make your development uh, pay off. So the fact that the Trump administration is opening up uh, uh, higher leasing levels in Anwar is not only encouraging in terms of giving you additional acreage to go out and explore on. It's also encouraging in the sense that if you find something, you're going to be able to develop your lease position to be able to turn it into turn it into the size of development you need to be able to make it pay off. So it's sending the Trump administration is sending very good signals to oil developers in terms of in terms of the outlook for uh, for development inside NPRA and even outside NPRA on state lands to the extent that your oil prospect might might bleed over or might also be on some NPRA leases. It's, it's sending very positive signals. And you see industry responding to that. You see Conoco going, going out with the five exploration wells. You see uh, oil search coming in and acquiring uh, Armstrong's interest. So it, it's a we're, we're entering, and, and that's even without layering on higher price levels. So we're right. entering we're entering a fairly a uh, good cycle, I think, uh, on the North Slope. We, we've got a bunch of positive indicators right now, um, and frankly, very few negative indicators. Concern about whether the legislature comes in and mucks with the oil, the oil tax system again. That'll be a concern. Uh, concerns about whether you know you're going to have litigation over the Trump administration's expansion of development opportunities on the slope. But by and large, I think that uh, the indicators that are coming out of the slope right now are very positive. 
Uh, I want to spin this out as to what this, how, what effect this has in the state of Alaska. But Harold sent me a e uh, message here based on our discussion about price and production. And uh, his comment is, once the price of oil maintains above 60, the fracking companies will be back online. This will be an increase in supply. Price is the, uh, in the market is the 800-pound gorilla. There's always been a positive correlation with price and supply. The high cost barrier for the North Slope has been mitigated by three decades of North Slope development. In short, the North Slope legacy fields are cash cows for the oil companies. Your comments on that? Well, they are cash cows for the oil companies, but but the fact that we're having and, and people usually say that and say, well, they're just gonna they're just gonna wind those down. They're just gonna play those out, keep producing oil out of the out of the out of the legacy fields and, and keep winding those down and just taking the cash off of it, not reinvesting. I think what we're seeing now is that we are attracting additional investment to the slope, that they're not just being viewed that the slope's not just being viewed as cash cows. It's being viewed as as an opportunity uh, for additional investment and additional fines. I think that's what we're seeing in the five exploration wells that Conoco is going out with. I think I think that's what we're seeing in uh, in the oil search uh, uh, investment, that people are viewing the slope not only as a cash cow opportunity, but also as an investment development opportunity. Uh, I do. Again, I want to see what the effect of these things is going to be on the state, but we're up against the break. Uh, we're going to continue the Michael Duke show. AM 700 KBYR, Oldies 102.1. Welcome back to the Michael Duke Show, your home for Common Sense Radio. Brad Keithley is our guest. We're continuing now our discussion of oil, gas, the budget, and politics. Uh, when we Before we went uh, to break, we were talking about the increase in uh, oil uh, resources, discoveries, new investment that's going to be happening on the slope. Brad, what does that all spell for the state of Alaska in the long run? Well, I think I think positive positive things. Let, let's sort of break it into price and production. Price, um, if, the oil price yesterday. Well, the oil price over the last few days has, has soared above sixty dollars a barrel. Uh, yesterday, it touched sixty four. It's back down to sixty three today. Sort of some profit taking going on, I think. Uh, but we're, we're looking at the potential for a sort of a breakthrough on oil price regime. And now, talking about oil prices that start in the sixes instead of starting the fives. Uh, I just pulled up the the price forecast that underlies the administration's revenue outlook. Uh, for the next 10 years that they published on a preliminary basis a couple of weeks ago. And they predict a, a, their, their revenue forecast is predicated on an oil price for fiscal year 2018, the current fiscal year, of uh, $54. They don't get they don't get to the sixty three dollar level that we're at right now until FY twenty twenty. So if we've if we've broken through and we're now in a sixty dollar price regime uh, on oil prices, we're talking about a not immaterial change uh, over the revenue forecast that the that the that the administration is predicating their their budget and their fiscal plan on. Um, Production, uh, the administration's forecast has sort of caught up to the current production wave. Uh, and frankly, I think their production prediction, their production outlook now is fairly robust. They've taken into account risk adjusted to some degree, but taken into account uh, Armstrong's fine, now the oil search Repsol uh, project. They've taken into account uh, Conoco's activity and projected that out. If we, if we see Another surge of investment on the slope in response to price or in response to things like uh, the MPRA opening up or oil searches investment, other people following with that, and see, and see increase in, in production, that would be helpful also. But right now, I think the administration is pretty good on their production outlook. But price, um, I, I think the administration has – we've, you and I have talked about this over, over the last couple of years. I think the administration's been wrong on price fairly consistently, been too low on price. And it looks like if we're breaking into a $60 price regime, they're, they're low again. Um, and, right. and that uptick in price could be very helpful. Uh, we're talking with Brad Keithley here on the Michael Duke Show, AM 700, KB Wire, and Oldies 102.1. Um, you know, speaking of this uptick in price and their fiscal outlook, Senator Pete Kelly had an opinion piece in the Alaska Journal of Commerce, which kind of pokes some points of fingers at the administration, saying that their numbers were 
I, I guess I'll be polite and say they were flawed. Uh, and in some cases, I think some people were saying they were potentially underselling it intentionally to kind of gin up a crisis, which the senator says is just not there. What are your thoughts on Pete Kelly's uh, opinion piece there? Well, I'll, two things. One, the, the the part of me that wants to be nice to Senator Kelly and the Senate Republicans is, yeah, you're right. Uh, uh, the administration has been under forecasting, whether intentional or not. Governor Walker came back with a piece in response to Kelly's that said, you know, he took he took offense at, at, at the senator suggesting the administration had intentionally underplayed revenues. Um, but the Senator Kelly's right in the sense that that I think you and I have talked about the administration uh, uh, under forecasting revenues and, and painting a more dismal fisc fiscal picture than I think than I think is fair. But but so that's the part of me that wants to be nice to Kelly. But but the but the problem with Senator Kelly and the problem with the Senate Republicans is they say that on the one hand, and then they go out and cut the PFD uh, on the other. They impose a PFD tax. On, on every Alaskan, a PFD tax of 50 percent on every Alaskan, take $750 million out of, the, out of the private sector, moving it to the state through the PFD tax, uh, cause a billion dollars by the time you add in the multiplier effect, cause a billion dollars in damage to the overall Alaska economy uh, by moving that money uh, over to the government side or sort of keeping it in savings. Um, and, and, and so – it, it, it's sort of the pot calling the kettle black, right? I mean, the, the, the Senate Republicans are saying, hey, administration, you've done bad things by underestimating revenue and say that we need additional uh, new revenues. Uh, we, we, we think you're wrong about that. But the Senate Republicans, the very same Senate Republicans, have adopted new revenue measures of their own because they they can't control spending and they, they have used uh, uh, predictions of – of the state's revenue picture that I think are are understated. So, yeah, Kel, I mean, Kelly's using this as a as a political moment to try to say that the that the Senate Republicans are on the right track, but the Senate Republicans aren't on the right track. They have taken, they have adopted new revenue measures that have been what ICER calls the the largest adverse impact on the overall economy. Are quote by far the worst for Alaska families. Have taken 700 plus million dollars out of the private sector, have caused a billion dollars in loss uh, in terms of economic uh, activity, uh, overall economic activity in the state, overall income in the state, um, and 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 it's hard for me to get, you know, very very enthused about Kelly's claims against the administration when the Senate Republicans themselves are guilty of the same thing that they're that they're trying to blame on the administration. Well, and again, that was the one it was, you know, so conspicuously absent from his commentary was any discussion on the PFD. It's not even mentioned in there because I think he understands. I mean, I think he's starting to understand that this is a this is a very sore subject with Alaskans. And and, and people are understanding that this is the largest tax we've seen, um, uh, you know, in the in the in the in the state's history. I mean, really, that's what it ends up being is a huge tax. You actually broke down the numbers and said it was ironic that the the, the U.S., uh, the Republicans, the congressional Republicans <laughs> at the national level are fighting to get Americans back $1,100 per family in taxes uh, in their new tax plan, and yet the state of Alaska is then taxing those same group of four people to the tune of over $4,000. Yeah, it's it, it, it that that is that is an amazing statistic. So, the 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 Senate when the House uh, Republicans announced the House Ways and Means, Com Means Committee announced the Republican tax plan, they made a big deal out of the fact that the whole plan uh, would have the effect of saving eleven what is eleven hundred eighty two dollars for the average family, average American family of four, uh, right. and that and that it was worth the fight to put this money, you know, given the economic times we're in, said the economic said the Republicans. It's it's worth the fight to to put this money back into the economy, and 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 you're right. You just compare that to us what the Alaska Senate Republicans have done. Uh, they've taken almost four times more out of the pockets of the same family in Alaska, the same wage earning family <laughs> in Alaska uh, through the PFD tax. So what the, what the congressional Republicans are fight, fighting to do on the one hand. The Alaska Senate Republicans are take are taking back plus, uh, you know, four times more. Uh, on the other hand, it's it's a 
it, it's ironic that it's the Alaska Senate Republicans uh, that are that have that have hurt the economy the most, adopted the 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 fiscal measure that has the largest adverse impact on the overall economy is by far the worst for Alaska families, pushes 12 to 15,000 Alaskans, 2 percent of the population, back below the poverty line. It's just ironic that, you know, these these Republicans, so-called Republicans at the, at, in the Alaska Senate who, you know, want to say that they're free market and they're, you know, private sector oriented are the very ones who have pulled that money out of the private sector and put it back, put it back into the government's pocket. And and comparing that to what the congressional Republicans are doing is just just makes that even more astounding. Well, and the true irony is the fact that this money didn't even end up going into spending on government, so it didn't stimulate the economy in any way, small or large, because it basically ended up just sitting in the account. So I need to add insult to injury. It wasn't even turned, you know, half a time in the economy as government money is wont to do, uh, let alone the one, one and a half times that, that it does in the private sector. It just sits there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Kelly's are, yeah, you're right that Kelly's piece doesn't, doesn't comment on the, on the permanent fund dividend, the, the permanent fund dividend tax uh, at all. I, what they're trying to do, in my opinion, and, and, and Governor Walker's response to Kelly doesn't mention it either. What they're trying to do is bank that 50% tax, you know, say it's done, it's over, stop talking about it. Uh, it's in it's in our pocket, and now let's let's fight about these other taxes. Uh, that that's we're in a recession. Alaska's in a recession. I'm not sure I'm not sure that gets through to legislators when you talk to them. We are in a recession. That means our economy is going backwards. Jobs are going down. Income Alaska income is going down. Alaska families are hurting. That's what a recession does, and. And for them to pull the lever that has the largest adverse effect on the overall economy of all the new revenue measures, that means it costs the most in terms of income. It costs the most in terms of jobs. We reduce jobs. They pulled the lever that reduces jobs the most. Uh, for them to for them to be pulling that lever uh, in the midst of a recession is just shocking. I mean, it's just, you, you, you don't think that people would do that. You don't think they would take uh, the, 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 the route that has the largest adverse impact uh, on the overall economy, but that's what they've done. And, you know, and Kelly just doesn't, uh, he, he just overlooks it, uh, tries to look past it in his piece and say, you know, the Senate Republicans are fighting hard to, to avoid new taxes. Well, no, you aren't. <laughs> you've you've passed the seven hundred and fifty million dollar tax. You passed a tax that has the largest adverse impact on the overall economy. You aren't fighting hard to do anything. You've already given in uh, to uh, 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 on 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 that measure. And and now you're gonna you, now you're gonna argue about the next tax. Well, guys, it's we need to go back and talk about the tax that you passed. We're in the midst of a recession. We need to talk about what you did to make that situation worse. And, and and they of course they don't want to, but it's but but it's just Kelly's piece. I I, I honestly my first reaction when I read it was I, I just laughed. I mean, how, how can you legitimately sit there and say, you know, we're we're fighting hard against taxes. The administration has been has been less than forthcoming. You guys have have hit, have hidden production and hidden oil prices when you yourself, the Alaska Senate Republicans are hiding from the fact that you've passed the largest tax in Alaska history. You've taken a billion dollars out of the private economy. You have you have done the very thing that has by far, according to ICER, quote, by far the worst impact on Alaska families. How how can you write a piece that complains about somebody else when you yourself have done that? Brad Keithley is our guest here on the Michael Duke show. AM 700 KBYR at Oldies 102.1. Brad, this is part and parcel of what we talked about. This seems to be the new play. The new play is to down, kind of downgrade and, and hide the fact that the dividends are gone. They want to stop talking about it. In fact, what they really want to do is they want to just act like it's already passed and they've already enshrined and, and in statute changed the PFD payout uh, because they just say it's, it's just a done deal. Uh, what what do we do from here? Where do we go from here? Less than two minutes uh, to try and fix this and, and make this right. Well, a lot of people talk about uh, talk about electing a new governor. We need to elect we need to elect a new legislature too. If if the Senate Republicans uh, and and those in the House who have done similar things, if they can't stand up and say, look, we're going down the wrong path, 
we've, we've enacted a tax. It's, it's the worst tax we possibly could enact. It affects uh, uh, it's by far the worst for Alaska families. It's put 12 to 15,000 addition, Alaskans, additional Alaskans below the poverty line. If they can't stand up and say that's wrong, uh, then, then they need to be replaced. Senator Mia Costello uh, on Senate Bill 91 wrote a piece and said, I was wrong on, on SB 91. I shouldn't, have, I shouldn't have supported it. We need to repeal SB 91 or, or significantly change it. She had, the, she had the courage on SB 91 to stand up. But Mia Costello is one of those who's voted for the PFD tax that has the largest adverse impact on the Alaska economy, by far the worst on Alaska families. She's voted for that. And she hasn't said she's wrong about that. Frankly, she needs to be replaced. If she yeah. doesn't see the yep. error the air of her ways, she needs to be replaced. Brad Keithley, out of time. Thanks for coming in and joining us. I'm 100% in agreement with you. Appreciate your calls today. AM 700.